Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sherry Zhang. I'm the Regional Reform Manager for North Asia at Victoria Union. Welcome to our International Agents Personal Development Webinars. We are having four different topics in four days. Today is the first one, and we're going to talk about skin care. How do we manage our skin effectively? And how do we choose skin care products without spending lots of money? First of all, I'd like to introduce you to Claire Simpson. Claire is a lecturer and a course chair for Bachelor of Dermal Science at VU. In the first part of her presentation, she's going to talk about the best practice in managing skin health, skin repair, and regeneration. Let's welcome Claire. The first thing though, and See if I can get to this next slide. Excellent. <laughs> so our approach to healthy skin regeneration and repair is to consider a number of things. So we want to look at what the main concern is that people actually have. We usually go for a combination of treatments. There's never just one size fits all in this area. It's always about combining our different approaches to get the best outcomes for our clients. And you'd be looking at having a range of different things to get the best results as well. And that is very much tailored to the individual then. And we often look at things like first, second and third line treatments. In dermal sciences, some of the treatments that we do are very expensive. Some of the treatments require quite an intensive period of what we call downtime. So you may not look too presentable for a couple of days after the procedure, for example. So sometimes what we would ideally like to do may not be the option because it's too um, cost prohibitive, it's too time consuming to have that procedure, or it requires a bit of downtime that the person just simply can't have. So we always have these different approaches and different approaches also allows us to react to what we're seeing. So if our first line of treatments doesn't get the complete result we're looking for, we've got other options available as well. So the first thing we need to look at if we're, our aim is to have healthy looking skin and healthy skin functioning wise, we need to sort of visualize, well, what does that actually mean? So when I was thinking about this topic, I thought, well, what, what are we saying when we're, we're saying we're asking for healthy skin? What does healthy skin actually mean? And in a way, our skin health is intrinsically linked to how our skin looks. So we're lucky in dermal sciences and it's easy to sort of dismiss our area a bit as being purely focused on aesthetic, on looking good. But the two things are actually linked to each other. And so healthy skin is better looking skin. But again, we need to characterise, well, what does that actually mean? So I've worked out this sort of wheel effect of, of the different priorities for it and the things that I sort of thought when I was considering this, what I'd be looking for that would tell me that someone had a healthy looking skin. And in dermal sciences, if we were preparing someone to have a plastic surgery procedure, for example, what we'd be wanting is skin that's a fairly smooth, texture. We want a degree of firmness to the skin, particularly those of us who are uh, getting older. We want to have skin that's blemish free. We would like to have even pigmentation. And ultimately, we want to have skin that's nicely hydrated. So I've added that final point in there. And to me, that's always one of my biggest priorities is to have well hydrated skin. So I'll talk about each of those and the sort of treatments that we look at to address those particular concerns. So an overall picture of healthy skin is smooth, firm, blemish free, even pigmentation and well hydrated. And sometimes people might have some of these things but maybe not all of the things are working together. So that helps us identify if someone comes to us and says, well, I've got fairly smooth skin, it's fairly blemish free, but I've got uneven pigmentation. 
then we know what sort of modalities that we'll use and what sort of treatment plans we might develop for someone to have. So let's have a look at each in turn, starting with smooth texture. So the sort of treatments in dermal that we would do for smooth textured skin is things like those peeling treatments that we were talking about. These tend to be more clinical things. So again, we, we would do these treatments if someone specifically comes with a textural issue, issue with their skin. So for example, in Australia, quite often that's because of quite a lot of sun exposure and you can end up with skin being quite uneven texture and a lot of the sort of dryness. So we might do chemical peels and we can do chemical peels to def differing depths. And sometimes what you're aiming to do with that is chemical peels not only will peel off the surface of the um, skin, so the stratum cornea and the very top layer of the skin will be peeled, but also what happens when you do that is there is a signaling mechanism. There's a chemical signaling that happens within the skin and that then stimulates the cells down in the bottom layers to start multiplying a little bit faster to replace essentially what's been lost but that means that you increase the cell turnover of the skin. So that helps bring essentially healthier, unaffected skin to the surface. So we do chemical peels. We can do microdermabrasion, which is using more of an abrasive, um, we usually we use crystals or a diamond tip to actually mechanically abrade the skin. So rather than using chemical means, we're using a, a mechanical means. And there's also hydrobrasion, which is essentially using water under a degree of pressure, again, to stimulate and to remove that topmost layer of the skin that not only has an effect on that top layer, though, it has a knock on effect on the deeper layers of the skin and ultimately results in a smoother textured skin. The second one's firmness, and that, that's often one that we require more as we get a little bit older. And there's various different approaches to very different levels here. And I've, I have put them in no particular order. Uh, it was more when I was thinking about the different options available that I put them down on the, on the screen here. But we do things like fractional resurfacing. Now, what fractional resurfacing is, is we're using a laser device the laser, laser device has a um, beam of light that essentially penetrates the skin like a pin prick into the skin and it coagulates the tissue in that little column that that light, light enters in on. And it basically does that over the whole surface of the skin. And the reaction of that is very common in a range of our treatments. So skin needling does much the same thing and some of the other treatments do the same thing where whenever you cause that little area of damage in the skin, it stimulates your skin to respond by healing. And that healing response when it's held in a very controlled environment that we do, what it does is when your skin's repairing, it forms new collagen and collagen tightens up. So as it's healing, the skin's being pulled tighter. And so if you do something like a fractional resurfacing over a particular area that has maybe a little bit of a loss of firmness, there's a little bit of skin laxity, or you do skin needling over that area, what will then happen is as the skin responds to that, goes through inflammation and repair, it will tighten up a little bit in that area. And we can do that in a very controlled manner and end up with some good non-surgical tightening of the skin by doing those treatments. Radio frequency does a very similar thing, as does the ultrasound therapy. So these are using different, in this case, sound wavelengths to, again, um, heat up the tissue. And so where the fractional and skin needling is more of a direct trauma to the skin, these other devices are a little bit of a gentler approach where they're using heating of the skin to do a very similar thing. So it still heats the tissue, it makes the tissue go through inflammation and repair and tighten up a little bit, but maybe not quite to the same extent as the fractional resurfacing or skin needling would do. And then you've got things like IPL that can do some very gentle firming of the skin as well. And that's 
the approach to using these will be quite different. And again, that's where the first, second and third line sort of treatments come in, where the IPL and um, the BBL treatments are firming, but you would have a series of those treatments and they're very gentle treatments. You wouldn't see necessarily a dramatic result immediately, but over time you would get an improvement in the skin. The radio frequency and ultrasound, that's a little bit quicker in its, its action, but again, you would need a course of treatments to see the full effects. The fractional resurfacing, and in some instances, the skin needling will be a more dramatic effect. Fractional resurfacing will generally be a once-off treatment that you would have, and you would get that effect on the healing of that particular single treatment. So let's look at blemish-free. Now, blemishes can be all sorts of different skin conditions. And obviously the, the one we tend to think about quite often is, is an acne skin, for example, but there could be other things that are causing blemishes to the skin. There could be some sort of skin rashes, a dermatitis, a psoriasis, a rosacea, etc. So blemish-free actually requires lots of different approaches depending on what you're actually seeing there. There is a lot of clinical skin care and that's what I'm going to talk about in the next little presentation is about the sort of ingredients that you might look for for different conditions and there are lots that are um, quite sophisticated what we call cosmeceutical ingredients which have a little bit of a, a biological effect on the skin and can help for example with acne skin there are some that can normalize the sebaceous glands activity and their secretions and so brings that back to a more normal level can help with peeling um, so you might be doing that to help with the blockages that you get with acne there's light therapy so led light light emitting diodes that we can use that helps with blemishes and sometimes we'll use certain photoactive agents with the light source to get a particular response in the skin um, there's laser therapy, which is particularly effective. This is uh, otherwise named cold lasers. So these are the therapeutic lasers, the ones that you may be familiar with, perhaps in physiotherapy settings, for example. And they're used for wound healing, but they can also be very effective with people with psoriasis or eczema and dermatitis type conditions. Um, lymphatic drainage is a treatment that we do. It's more of a um, manual treatment and this addresses the issue of fluid retention within the skin. Now that sort of seems a bit sort of unrelated to blemishes but when you've got someone with a acne skin they often will really benefit from having these lymphatic drainage treatments as well because any time that you have inflammation you actually even though you don't always see this the reality is within your skin, you've got a lot of fluid being produced. And the more fluid that fills up into your um, tissues, the less effective those tissues are at functioning. So by doing that treatment, we can just help with that side of, of the problem as well. So for pigmentation, again, there's lots and lots of treatments. And I think pigmentation is an issue no matter what skin type or skin colouring you have. It's obviously a big problem with people with very pale skin like myself. It's often indicating that I've been out in the, the sun too much and I've got an accumulation of, of UV damage over time. However, with a lot of the darker skin types, uneven pigmentation can actually be the key sign of ageing in those skins. So someone with a very pale skin like mine, skin aging is quite obvious. My skin becomes saggier and, and less elastic. But with a, a darker skin type, often that's less of a problem, but uneven blotchy pigmentation might be more of a problem. There is a reason why skin lightening treatments are very popular in countries where people generally have darker skins. So even pigmentation is a concern across the board and worldwide. And again, there's, there's a range of approaches we can have to that. There are clinical skincare where we have a range of ingredients that normalize melanin production in the skin, but we also have melanin inhibition, inhibition from some of the ingredients that we can use as well. And they help 
prevent too much excessive melanin production and pigment production in the skin. Um, skin peeling treatments and some of the fractional treatments and laser treatments can help break up the pigment in the skin and um, help that appearance as well. And that, that's quite a common one that we would use to deal with the more excessive pigment and um, even things like freckles can be um, treated with a laser to, to lighten them off and, and targeted very specifically with that. Um, just on that note, obviously within Australia, skin cancer is a major concern within Australia. And one of the things that we teach our students because we know that treating pigment is such a big part of our business, we need our students to be able to do that safely. So we actually treat, teach our students how to do a thorough skin analysis and look at the pigmented skin lesions. And we teach them to use a device called a dermatoscope. And a dermatoscope is a, essentially like a microscope that you put on the skin and it, it transmits certain wavelengths of light that allow you to see quite deep. They, the light wavelengths can actually penetrate through the layers of the skin so that you can see some of the deeper features of a pigmented lesion. And it's what's used in many of the skin cancer check clinics. And some of our graduates actually work in that setting doing these skin cancer checks and what they're looking for are certain features that you can see in the dermatoscope that tells them whether a lesion is what we call a suspicious lesion and one that would need to be referred on to a doctor for further advice and treatment, or whether it was safe for us to treat that as well. And there's, there's always that sort of balance between the two. So these are less of a, a home care treatment of the, those sort of devices and much more of a clinical approach to treating um, pigmented lesions on the skin too. And then the final aspect and not to be downplayed at all is the hydration. I think when your skin is looking moist, it tends to help with all of those other things as well. So when your skin has a good hydration level, when it's well moisturized, it's going to be functioning much better. And that, that even includes things like um, there have been studies done on how um, rapidly drugs can penetrate through the skin. So there's quite a lot of interest in, in drug permeation through the skin so that people don't have to take tablets or don't have to have injections. There are drug delivery through the skin, which is a big area of research. But a lot of that is dependent on having skin at a good maximum hydration level. And that allows the skin to perform in the way that it needs to for that um, drug delivery. And that goes, goes for everything. We need our skin to be well hydrated to function well. The more dehydrated it becomes, the more prone you are to developing conditions like dermatitis and like eczema. And the more likely it is to exacerbate or make worse conditions like rosacea, acne even. It, acne needs to be well hydrated as and have a good hydration water level in the skin because the more it gets dry the more it gets clogged the more problem you have with acne so hydration is something that's important for everyone and the things we can use for that we do focus on hydration of the skin by using clinical skin care and that that's our first thing that we would do but Clinical skincare for hydration is only as good as you're as long as you're using the clinical skincare. Um, sometimes, if people have chronic problems with dehydration, we may have to address other things that are going on. So, if it's dehydration related to a dermatitis, we may have to address the the dermatitis condition first before we can then have the clinical skincare keeping the level of hydration quite high. Sometimes if it's because of photo damage, which is quite common um, for us to see, we might then use that as an indicator that people need a peeling treatment. So the peeling treatments, again, it can stimulate that cell turnover. You can end up with the skin on the surface functioning that little bit better because it's essentially been renewed from the lower layers. And so therefore you have a, a functionally better top to the skin and it's better able to then hold on to its moisture levels and therefore our clinical skin care will be that much more effective. But in our next presentation, I will talk a lot more about that sort of clinical skin care and what you're looking for in there as well.
So back to you, Sherry. Did you want me to stop sharing my screen? There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Um, so before we go to the next uh, slides, uh, can we please have um, the other polling question? Uh, Nat, do you want to help with the polling questions? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is the first question. How much you spend on your mostly, your, sorry, your most recently purchased skincare products? Less than $50, $50 to $100, $100 to $20, or maybe more than $200? Maybe Claire, you want to make a guess, which is the most <laughs> common <laughs> Oh, I can see, so, I can see yeah. the answers coming in, so, so I, I have a cheap lead on this. I should, I I should close it first, yeah. I, I was sitting here tonight thinking, please don't my online orders arrive while I'm doing this. Please don't arrive while I'm doing this. <laughs> I thought that'll give the game away that Claire has been indulging in skincare in isolation. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, quite a lot of people, I think they spend less than $50 on the skincare products. I think I probably spend maybe maybe similar or slightly lesser, I guess, than 27%. I, I probably do too. I, I, I'm probably more in, depending on what I'm getting, I'd be in <laughs> those lower ranges. Um, but there's a huge range of, of skincare um, price points, essentially. And that relates very well actually to what I'm talking about next, which is about those specialized active ingredients. Some of those mm -hmm. are incredibly expensive to include in a formulation, but there are certain things about a basic formulation that can actually get you fantastic results. So it's reasonable to spend less on some things and more on maybe others if you're wanting something for a specific purpose. I'm, I'm very eager to know what is the ingredient that is you know, suitable for us so that I can spend maybe less than $50. Yeah. Yep. The next one. Yep. What do you think are the key ingredients in anti-aging creams? So there's no right or wrong answer. Just uh, make a guess. Titanium dioxide, vitamin C, retinoid, niacinamide. So it depends on your preference. So here we go. 77% of them choose vitamin C. And, That's yeah. a, a very valid, valid answer there. And actually all of them are valid answers. We were a bit tricky with this question. In, and all of these are key features of what we would typically term an anti-aging type product for different reasons. And I'll talk about those briefly when I go through the presentation next too. Sure. All right. Uh, I think... This is the last question, Claire, so maybe we can begin with the second presentation. Yeah, right. thank you. We'll get started on that. Okay, so for this second presentation, I was asked to talk about what are the key ingredients to look for when purchasing products. Now, this was a gargantuan ask really because there are literally hundreds and thousands of, of different types of ingredients that are on the market but what I thought I would do is again try and give you a bit of an insight on, into 
what we as dermal clinicians do and how we look at this in perhaps a different way to what you might be used to if you say go to a beauty salon or you go to a cosmetic counter counter you'll be told certain things about particular ingredients and it's easy to get the impression that they're the be all and end all of products but what we look at is these four particular elements of a product. So for me, an ideal product needs what we call cosmetic elegance, and I'll talk about what that means in a moment. You need something for skin conditioning. So this is the hydration, the moisturization of the product. You do need something for protection, and that relates in a way to what we were saying about pigment in the previous presentation. And then there's a huge gamut of specialised actives. And what tends to happen when you go into a um, department store to look at skincare is there's an awful lot of emphasis put on the specialised actives, but your activities are probably telling you more about the cosmetic elegance than anything else in that product. So again, I'll look at each of these elements and discuss how they can come together in, and help you make some more informed Formed decisions or, or help you realise um, how your approach to skincare might be telling you some things but maybe not other things as well. So we start by talking about cosmetic elegance. Now this is a term that we use in formulation chemistry and essentially it's saying that if, if your product um, doesn't look and feel the way it should, no one's going to buy it. And certainly if someone buys it, they're not going to use it for very long or repeat buy it if it doesn't have what we would term cosmetic elegance. So I want you to imagine, and I imagine you've all been in this situation where you've gone into a shop and you're wanting to purchase a product. So in this instance, I've given you the example of purchasing a night moisturizer. The first thing you tend to do is have a look at the moisturizers on show. You've picked up a tester. Now, nearly all of the, the department stores and chemists, etc., that sell products will have a tester that you can try. So what do you do next? What's your next action when you pick up that product? Now, invariably, if you're like me, and I think most people are probably like me, you take the product, you take off the lid of the product, you might have a little smell, you'll take a little bit of the product and you'll rub that product probably on your hand or arm and then you might have another smell and that's pretty typical and every single student I teach does exactly the same thing when they pick up a product. So that's the usual first action that you take. Now it's important to say well what are you looking for there? What's, what's that action actually telling you about? is this actually going to tell you anything useful about the product? And I suppose it's worth thinking, you know, can you forego that activity and just simply look at ingredients? And I certainly wouldn't recommend that. I think that doing that action of testing a bit of a product on your hand or on your arm or even on your face, if, if that's appropriate, will tell you quite a bit about the cosmetic elegance of that product. So you're expecting certain things, so you'll have certain perceptions around the product that you're purchasing. So generally for a night moisturiser, we would generally formulate a night moisturiser as a slightly richer formula. So it might be slightly thicker than a day cream would be. We would expect it to be slightly more what we call emollient, so a little bit more moisturising. So actually using that product, you're testing whether it's in the form that you're expecting. So in the cream form, in the consistency, the thickness that you would expect. You're trying it on your, your hand to see, does it feel like you want it to feel? And there can be quite a number of factors that will influence what you're expecting there. So a night cream that I'm expecting because I'm a little bit older and I have problems with um, dehydration of my skin, I would like something fairly rich. I don't want it to feel greasy on my skin when I'm using this product because that would be a bit yeah. I want to feel though as though it's hydrated my skin. I do want my skin to feel moist afterwards and all of those things 
I can actually perceive by using that product in that way. What I'm not getting is any impression of maybe the lasting effects of that. And it's certainly not telling me anything about the active ingredients in that product. Fragrance wise is, is quite an interesting thing. There's a lot of, um, I guess, move to fragrance free. Um, however, I personally like a bit of fragrance in a product, but again, it comes down to expectations. So there's quite a lot of fragrance theory when we're doing formulation chemistry. For example, if you were looking at a, a night moisturizer, you probably wouldn't necessarily expect a light, fresh, citrus type aroma to that, because that's that sort of tends to psychologically make you think more of um, daytime, perhaps more appropriate to shower products or, or cleansing products rather than something that you associate with moisturising of the skin. And there's also things that we do that, that are a little bit trickier. And for example, um, if I was to use something like sea minerals as part of my active um, formulation, I might choose a fragrance that echoes that active ingredient. So I might use a fragrance that has a, a sea salt fragrance or a sea aroma or a, an aroma that's consistent with those essential ingredients, ingredients, those active ingredients that I've put in there. So it sort of marries those two thoughts together because at this point in time, when people are trying a product on their hand, they can't tell about those actives, but they may get a hint about those actives by experiencing the particular aroma of that product. So they're, they're all the tricks of the, the game uh, there, but it can tell you quite a lot. The other thing is as well is you're going to be using this product on your face. So it's going to be something that you tolerate and something that you find enjoyable. And often people will use products, particularly if they're used to using quite a lot of products, I'm sure that people will have products that they use purely because they like the smell of them, they like the aroma, they like the experience of using it, it feels nice to use something and therefore that's a part of the choice that you're making is about cosmetic elegance. Other things to do with cosmetic elegance are much more serious though. For example, um, sunscreens, there's a lot more emphasis needed on cosmetic elegance of sunscreens because your sunscreen needs to be worn over a very large area of your body and of, of course it has to be applied at a fairly high concentration to give you the protection that's needed. If you have a product which it does tend to be a bit greasy, um, then people may not use that, particularly if you're at the beach in sand, there's nothing worse than having a greasy product over a large area of your body and then getting sand in contact with that as well and, and sticking to you. So people's ability to use your product in the way that you need them to use it is also quite um, important to look at that cosmetic elegance of the product too. So let's move on to the next one. We'll, we'll visit back to cosmetic elegance a little bit throughout as well. So the next thing you're looking for is skin conditioning. So skin conditioning e ingredients are those that give the, the night cream its moisturising qualities. So there's two main categories of ingredients. There's what we call humectant ingredients and there's emollient ingredients here. Now again I can't give you every name of these ingredients. It, it would be a list that would go on and on and, and make for a very boring presentation I, I would say, but I've given you a few key players in this area that you might be familiar with. So with humectants, they're ingredients that have a molecular structure to these ingredients that draws water to them, it binds water to the skin. So the idea is you're applying this product to the surface of the skin, it's holding on to water and it does that by either drawing the water from the deeper layers of the skin or from the atmosphere and it holds that water in that area to give a nice moist feeling. Because these are water soluble ingredients, 
they can give a hydration to the skin but without feeling heavy on the skin. So they're a very light product to use on the skin. And these are things like hyaluronic acid, glycerin, urea, propylene glycol, even the alpha hydroxy acids are humectant ingredients and things like sodium lactate. So they're all the sort of ingredients that you might see. Hyaluronic acid, I imagine many of you will have heard of hyaluronic acid. It's very, very popular at the moment. Some of the um, molecular weight hyaluronic acids can get a little bit on the expensive side, but these are not too expensive, these sort of ingredients to have. Glycerin is an interesting one. Glycerin is the standard humectant. It's the humectant by which all other humectants are measured in scientific processes. Um, and glycerin is very cheap. <laughs> we can't use it at a high quantity. You can't use more than 5% in a formulation. Um, otherwise, it becomes a bit sticky. So it doesn't have very good cosmetic elegance. If you use too much of it, you need to use just a small amount of glycerin. But it's very effective at drawing water to itself. And it actually can modify how the skin hydrates to give a much long, longer lasting effect. So even when the glycerin is no longer in contact with the skin, you can have some ongoing effects from the glycerin within the products too. So these are quite interesting hydrating ingredients, ingredients that are designed to hold moisture onto the skin. And you'll often see these in a serum. So I'm, I'm quite a big fan of using serums underneath moisturizers because they usually have quite a high proportion of humectant ingredients, the water binding ingredients. Emollient ingredients, essentially to me, moisturization are two things humectants to get the water into the skin, but emollients to provide a barrier to that water being lost. So emollients are more of your oil-based products. So these are designed to moisturize the skin and support the barrier function of the skin. So your skin ultimately is a barrier. And even if you hadn't got any moisturizer on your skin, if you drop a drop of water onto the back of your hand, it will stay as a little ball of water. And that's because your skin naturally has a waterproofing to that topmost layer. So these are products that ingredients that actually support that. And this will be the range of things like oils that you can get in products, um, butters. Uh, many of you might have heard of things like shea butter and macadamia butter and cocoa butter. And then there's waxes. Now, these are a sort of different versions of, of the same sort of thing. They're all lipids, they're all oil-based products. Um, the oils tend to be in a liquid form. The butters tend to be like a butter, like a, a margarine sort of consistency. And waxes, I've, I've given you jojoba there, which is one exception to the rule. Jojoba is actually a liquid wax, but most waxes are solids. So they're a bit more, more of a, a um, quite a, a sort of, film forming um, on the surface of the skin that you can get. So there are literally hundreds of these ingredients. So I've given you some fairly limited examples here. But one thing I did want to talk about very briefly here was about this idea of natural, natural modified and synthetic oils. And this actually probably goes across most of the ingredients in cosmetic formulations. There's a lot of talk about whether natural is better than synthetic on here. And I just wanted to talk very briefly about that. Um, I personally think no, not necessarily better. And in some cases, it can be a little bit more problematic. So for natural oils, I'll, I'll start talking about natural oils. So these are often um, from plants um, that we can extract oils from, and we can do that through um, processing that is um, very minimally changing the structure of those oils. So they're very, very natural. Um, they don't require much in the way of chemical processing to extract them, and you can use them in a very sort of pure form. Now, that's lovely and it certainly helps you market your product. But quite often the trade-off of that as a, as a formulation chemist is that natural oils 
will often not absorb into the skin particularly well and you can sometimes compromise the cosmetic elegance of a product by having it feel too oily feel too greasy in it it also increases your chance because the oil hasn't been chemically modified in any way it is more prone to oxidization so we then have to include antioxidant sort of ingredients to try and help with that natural deterioration of that product over time and and what you would tell if a product has a high level of natural oils and it's not well um, protected against that oxidization you get a certain rancidity it's like like oils for cooking that have gone off they get that slightly off aroma to them so you have to be a little bit careful with using oils like that they can also have a higher irritancy profile in a product as well. So people, <coughs> excuse me, can be a little bit more reactive to some of the oils as well. So as a formulation chemist, we have to consider that too. A sort of compromise between the natural and synthetic is what we call natural but modified. So there are certain chemical modification techniques that can be used on natural oils. And what these can do is alter the chemical structure of the oil slightly so that it's less prone to oxidization, so that it combines with the other ingredients in a product to make a more stable product, and so that it will help with that absorption and that feel on the skin. So how the actual product will feel on the skin will be better. So one of the terms that we use with emollients is we often refer to dry emollients and what we're saying with dry emollients it sounds like a bit of a, a contradiction in terms but we're talking about a product where you you apply it you massage it in and your skin feels velvety and soft and hydrated but it doesn't leave any oily residue whatsoever. It feels like the skin is dry once that product has been um, massaged in. And we can achieve that with a natural, natural modified product. And that's quite important if you're looking at a, an eye cream, for example, or a day cream where you're intending to put makeup on top. You don't want any greasiness underneath. Um, so that, that can be a real appeal. And of course, if someone has an acne skin, the last thing I want is to feel like they've got a heavy oil on their skin from the actual product itself. So dry emollients is quite a, a cosmetically elegant um, appearance of those products to have. Um, that'll be things like um, your caprylic capric triglycerides are quite commonly used. Um, there are a lot of PEG oils you'll notice um, in products and they're natural but modified ingredients. Then you've got and things like um, synthetic oils. Now synthetic oils they can be a harder sell. They're, they're often a little less desirable um, for, from a consumer perspective but these can have great advantages as well. They can overcome the cosmetic elegance. So you can have a huge range of consistencies and feels and, and effects on the skin. Some of the issues around synthetics may be that they are from a non-sustainable source or a crude oil source um, th that may be a problem. This will be things like silicones. So dimethicone is the name given to a silicon ingredient. Now dimethicone is an interesting ingredient in that it gives absolute dry emollients. So nothing is better to give you dry emollients. It does a beautiful job at moisturizing the skin but leaving the skin feeling dry afterwards. But of course, it's from a, a non-sustainable source in some instances, and it can be film forming, which can be problematic in certain skin types. And again, it's a harder sell because it's a synthetic product in many instances. Um, it might be things like isopropyl myrostate. So these are um, basically manufactured in the lab products. Um, Sustainability wise, sometimes they can actually be an advantage because there is a certain amount of debate given to having products that are from a, a plant source, yet you've got huge fields of a plant just to produce a product for a 
cosmetic ingredient when that could be um, a field of plants for food production. So there's certain um, sustainability debates in this space as well. So that's, that's really me just introducing you to emollients. I'll, I'll move on to protection. We could talk forever about these things. I think protection is really important. And, and it's in here, I'm talking about protection from UV damage, from sun damage. And it really is the best thing that you can do to maintain skin health. And again, like I said in the previous presentation, no matter what skin color you have, you will benefit from protecting from UV. And that might be a case of evening your skin color um, toning, but there's also obviously the um, prevention of skin cancers. That's an important part of why we use UV protection in the form of sunscreens as well. So it does have a big anti-aging effect because a lot of what we see as skin aging is related to UV damage. And it also helps maintain an effective skin barrier. What can happen is if you have UV damage building over time, your skin cells are not working as effectively as they should be. And therefore your barrier tends to be more interrupted. And it's why if someone has quite a lot of UV damage, they often have quite a lot of um, dehydration dryness to their skin as well. And that's related to the skin barrier impairment from that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about sunscreens and clearly, you know, we could talk all day about sunscreens, but a few things to sort of look for in it. Now, most of you will be aware that sunscreens are promoted on the basis of their sun protection factor, the SPF. Now, SPF is talking primarily about the ability of the product to stop you burning. And burning of the skin is related to primarily UVB radiation. So the SPF factor doesn't always tell you that much about the UVA protection. And UVA is more strongly linked to the photoaging effects. So the skin aging effects and the dehydration that you get from UV is more UVA related than the UVB. The UVB is more strongly linked perhaps to skin cancers and burning, um, but it's not the full story of it. So SPF is telling you about the protection against burning. However, the way that these um, sunscreens work is that the um, higher the SPF is, the more likely it is to protect about against both UVA and UVB sort of accidentally. They're only being measured really by the UVB, but they will have a knock-on effect of being protection against UVA as well. So one of the things I often get asked is, what SPF are we looking for? And what's the difference between an SPF of 30, say, and a, an SPF of 50 plus? They're, they're big numbers at that stage. Now, the first thing to say about sunscreens is you need to be using them and having them on, in contact with your skin to get that full protection for the time that you have them. So um, the SPF effect is only going to be as good as you applying the correct amount and reapplying when necessary as well. But with the SPF 50 plus, it's giving you a protection of about 1 50th of the UV radiation it will allow through. And the SPF 30 is indicating that at 1 30th of the ambient UV radiation will be allowed through. The UVB protection though is really very comparable. And considering the differences with how people use um, sun protection, there is ostensibly no difference really between these two. So you get 98% UVB blocking from an SPF 50 plus, but you get 96% from a, an SPF of 30 anyhow. So there's not a huge difference in that area between the two and yeah, differences in how you apply and how you reapply um, will very quickly negate any um, statistical difference there. So either either is actually fine. You might want to look at things like broad spectrum. Often broad spectrum is a bit of a term that's given for 
a product that will cover more completely both the UVA and UVB. And water resistance may be necessary, particularly if you're looking at water sports and using a sunscreen. And one thing to remember is sunscreens all come with an expiry date as well. So I don't know whether you're so aware of that, um, but they can only guarantee the SPF activity for a certain period of time. So they're certainly within Australia and many countries of the world, they're required to put expiry dates on your sunscreen as well. So um, use it liberally um, while you have it because it will go off um, in very short measure as well. Mm. So the two types of sunscreen ingredients that we have, there's two broad categories of these. One is what we call a mineral sunscreen or a physical sunscreen or an inorganic sunscreen. And the other is the chemical ingredients or organic sunscreens. So there's two sort of categories, the mineral and the chemical. The sort of ingredients you're looking for, and this comes back to our prompt question at the beginning, was um, the sunscreen as being an important anti-aging technique to use is to use a sunscreen in your products each day. So inorganic sunscreens include things like titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And then you've got organic sunscreens and there's literally hundreds of different ingredients in here. But these are some of the common names that are given um, for these. They both work by absorbing scattering UV radiation. Um, so that it doesn't penetrate through to the deeper layers of your skin cells. And what you often have is a combination of ingredients. It would be very, very rare to just have a, a sunscreen with one ingredient in it, because particularly for these um, organic sunscreens, they each have a particular wavelength of UV radiation that they block particularly effectively and they, they are different. So often we will use in a formulation maybe up to five different ones in there to give the full level of protection. And that does two things. It gives us the full level of protection, but it also allows us to use slightly less of every ingredient as well. So you're not getting a, a big hit of one chemical um, in a product. The Many of you who are maybe a little bit au more au fait with the industry and the, the promotion and the marketing in this industry, there's a big promotion for inorganic sunscreens, um, which are the non-chemical sunscreens. Um, and it's sort of in a way a little bit related to that natural versus synthetic sort of argument. And whilst they are a desirable sunscreen, they, they reflect UV very well. So they have very minimal um, penetration into the skin, which is seen as quite desirable from a sunscreen. However, if you have enough titanium dioxide or zinc oxide to give you a SPF 30 or above, what will happen is you will compromise the cosmetic elegance of the product. So what tends to happen is the more of those ingredients we use because they're reflecting light, they will start to give your skin a very whitey sheen to it. And it will look a bit like the old zinc that you used to put on your face. You start to get a little bit of a whitey sheen to your face if you've got a high level of those ingredients. So to get an SPF of 30 or 50, yes, there might be some titanium dioxide and zinc oxide in that product, but ideally it would also have some chemical sunscreens to just push that SPF rating a little bit higher as well. One innovation in more recent years that has helped overcome some of the issues of cosmetic elegance in sunscreen products, because they, they are quite problematic um, as far as cosmetic elegance is concerned, um, is nanoparticles. So nanoparticles is essentially reducing titanium dioxide or, and zinc oxide to a, a nano size. So very, very small molecules and what your or small, small um, product size. And what then happens is you can get a very, very sort of nano depth thickness of product on the skin to give protection it allows those little um, inorganic particles to actually pack together much more closely so it can give very good sunscreen effect 
but because it's very they're very tiny particles you don't get that greasy feeling then on the surface so they're quite popular for that because it does overcome a lot of that cosmetic elegance issue um, however nanoparticles in all shapes and forms um, are also an area that we watch for having issues with nanotoxicity toxicity because essentially if something's at that sort of scale it means that it can penetrate a lot easier than other things can um, however the studies that have been done around sunscreen shows that they've got minimal penetration and are quite safe to use as a nanoparticulate form and then the final thing to talk about is those specialized actives there are literally hundreds of these <laughs> i could go on for for decades talking about about these different ones the broad categories of specialised actives are things like antioxidants are quite common in this space. And so these are things that help with prevent oxidisation of the product, but also help uh, present um, oxidisation, which is one of the causes of ageing in your skin as well. So they're quite desirable for that. So they counter, um, counter the effects of UV radiation, for example, on the skin. Um, pigment inhibition and reduction I was talking about before there's some various different ingredients specialized ingredients that can do that some will increase the cell turnover so that proliferative activity so the refreshing of the cells in the skin some will normalize sebum production some will enhance the barrier function of the skin so what I've done is just really chosen some of my favorites <laughs> so to speak and the key ingredients that I would be looking for is things like vitamin C. So vitamin C, actually all of these have multiple different effects on the skin. So vitamin C is very um, strong as an antioxidant. So it has good antioxidant effect on the skin, but it can also help um, with pigment damage and pigment changes in the skin. So to, to um, rectify pigment problems that you might have with the skin and it also helps with hydration of the skin. Um, vitamin B, so generally I would have a vitamin C as a daytime, um, either a serum that I use before I apply a product or sometimes you can get it in a powder form. Because of its, uh, its the way it works, it actually itself gets oxidised very, very quickly. So it needs to be in quite a stable form um, to do that and often the more expensive vitamin C preparations are those that have been stabilized better to keep the bioavailability quite high of the vitamin C. So it's one of the ingredients that it's worth spending a little bit more for. Um, vitamin B, I would tend to use this in the evening and um, often in the form of what we call niacinamide, which is one of the um, variants, molecular variants of that particular vitamin. Um, that we can use that's very well tolerated by the skin so we most people can use it without any problems we can use it at fairly high concentrations and again the money that you're paying for your vitamin b is often related to the amount that you would have the proportion that you would have the percentage in it in the formulation uh, again it's a it's a multi-use um product can help with cell turnover, it can help normalise sebum production, normalise pigment um, in the skin. So it does quite a range of different things, um, very important for acne skins, but also as an anti-aging ingredient would be quite common. Um, vitamin E is a antioxidant. We'll use it in products to actually stabilise the product from oxidisation anyhow. Um, and you can have that knock-on effect onto the skin. Retinoic acid or a vitamin A derivative is very common in anti-aging type preparations. And again, it's about um, helping to normalize the cell turnover and um, the proper um, cell signaling function as well, we use it for. Uh, it can also be used in certain forms for treatment of acne too. Um, plant polyphenols, there's lots of different ones. You may have heard of things like green tea extract. Um, turmeric um, falls into this category. So a lot of what we call herbal extracts or plant extracts, licorice extract, for example, um, 
all of those different ones are what we're looking for from those is actually what we call the plant polyphenols. So they're particular molecular compounds that are found in those plants. And usually they're molecular compounds from the plants that protect the plant in some way. So they can have an antioxidant effect for the plant. They can be antibacterial for the plant. They can help the plant um, protect itself from um, animal attack. Um, so it's part of plants' normal defense mechanism and often they're associated with the medicinal qualities of those plants as well. And so for example, with green tea extract, we're looking for um, particular um, plant polyphenols called catechins. And the catechins is the active part of the green tea. So when I'm doing formulation, rather than using green tea extract, I prefer to use the plant polyphenols as a concentrated form. And you pay more for doing that um, than you would for the, the green tea extract. But the problem with green tea is if I use a green tea extract, I will seasonally have differences in the levels of catechins that I get in that product, depending on whether it's been a good season for green tea or not. Um, for my camellia sinensis, whether that's been a good season or not, will determine the levels of the catechins actually present in, in that actual extract, where if I use just the concentrated form of the catechins, I know exactly what I'm getting. And you can use that in the formulation. And that actually has been um, shown in research to help protect um, against UV radiation and counteract some of the damage, UV damage to the skin as well. So that's an interesting one to look at. Other ones that you might have heard of is resveratrol, which is from red wine. Um, it's the, the key one that we use to say that red wine's good for us. <laughs> and that's used in a lot of um, cosmetic preparations as well. A very strong antioxidant. Most of the plant polyphenols are very strongly antioxidant. And then there's things like peptides. These are often synthetically produced little chains of amino acids that can have varying different effects on um, skin uh, cell signaling. So the chemical processes within the cells can actually be modified by the use of certain pep peptides. And that might be to um, increase proliferative activity or cell turnover. Um, it might be to um, help signal in a, a certain way to have, have the cells respond um, in whatever form that you're wanting it. To, to basically affect. The peptides are, because they tend to be synthetically produced and how we do that is we produce many, many hundreds and we test all of them. It's quite an expensive process. So they often, the inclusion of something like a peptide into a product will up the price of that product considerably as well. So a huge range um, there. I could talk about, about many different ones, but ultimately the take home message is we're looking for overall cosmetic elegance, something that's going to be nice to use that we can use and that will give us the feel that we want on the skin. And we'll primarily get that from using our skin conditioning agents, the humectants, the emollients. We need to protect our skin from the sun by using a sunscreen of some description. And then we might look at something like a specialised active ingredient to address a particular concern that we have. So that might be anti-aging and we'd be looking for something antioxidant and to help with increasing cell turnover. Or it might be something to help with uneven pigmentation, for example. So that is it for me. Hopefully you enjoyed that and found it interesting. I'll just stop my sharing to come back in case anyone has any, any questions. So uh, thank, yes, you, Claire. Claire. thank you so much for this very yeah. informative session. We do have a lot of questions actually um, coming, yeah, coming in the chat box. I know we're a little bit over time, but I hope you don't mind and stay a little bit late. Um, and answer I do questions. like to chat, don't I? <laughs> I? I do go on a bit. <laughs> so um, I guess one of the um, very popular questions is your recommendation. So... <laughs> What would you recommend us to choose? Like, what is your favorite? Um, perhaps give us your brand name. Like, what, which brand that you choose when you purchase your um, 
Oh, I, I use a huge range of products. Obviously, in my area, I get products thrown at me all the time <laughs> to use. Um, at the moment, um, I'm using a, a, a bit of a mixture. I'm using some. Um, oh, now you now you're really um, testing me. I've got some Clarins products that I, I've oh, used. Fun. I have some Synergy products. It's an Australian brand, um, actually made here in Melbourne. I use their vitamin B. Um, preparation. I use some advanced um, skin te technology or uh, some um, cosmetics, vitamin C preparation. Um, Skindor, I use their hyaluronic acid. They've got a serum, um, the product Skindor, which is a, a um, Spanish brand. Um, I also use the moisturizer as well. Um, I've got... <laughs> Oh, all sorts of that. I've got this nectar firm thing that does my neck. And yeah. So all, all sorts. I, I Dermalogica, I, I've got all bases covered. I, I use all sorts of different things. And it's one of those things where it's such an individual recommendation. You know, what I what works on my skin may mm. not work on other people's skin. Um, one thing that I have, which I, I rather like doing because I like a bit of moisture on my skin, I use... Um, Ella Bache have some drops, some oil drops that you can add mm. to a moisturizer to give it a boost. And I, I quite like using their botanical oil. I think possibly because it smells nice. Okay. But I think it, it makes my skin feel nice, but I'm not too sure whether that's a psychological effect or an actual effect <laughs> on that one, but I do enjoy using it. <laughs> yeah. So um, there is a question popping up and um, asking if you could attach the products that you are mentioning, but I guess as you as what you said before, um, because something uh, work on your skin might not work on others. So uh, we may, like when, when we uh, when we hear Claire's um, recommendation, we may rethink like whether or not those products will actually suit our skin. Um, so let's move to the other question. So the other question I'm seeing from the screen is that, is that safe to wear makeup over sunscreen? And <gasps> Yeah, actually, that's probably a nice one just to talk very briefly about is, is the sunscreen thing. If you're needing a sunscreen, um, say it's summer and, and you're wanting or, or you're in an area where there is a lot of UV radiation, so you're needing a good sunscreen. It's actually quite interesting because sunscreen, how it works on the skin, it actually binds with some of the proteins in the very top most layer of your skin. So you actually, the order to apply things is you apply sunscreen first, then your moisturizer, and oh. then yes, you can apply your um, product, your foundation, etc., over the top of that. The issue with applying three is you may end up with a bit of um, compromising of that cosmetic elegance. It might start to feel a bit heavy, but give it time to absorb. So you put the sunscreen on, leave it a few minutes to absorb and what we call adsorb, which means it's forming those bonds with the proteins in the skin. And that means it's anchored in position. Then you can apply your moisturizer, then you can apply the other and it won't feel quite so heavy. Oh, thank you. So I have been doing the wrong thing all the time. All it's quite time. common. I, I think most people <laughs> think that sunscreen should be last because it's yeah. the one that has to protect on the outside, yet it it's actually should be the first. All right, that's very uh, that's very useful tip from from you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, and also another question is that when we reapply the sunscreen, do we need to use cleansing water or rinse off the face first, or do we just simply directly reapply the sunscreen? If you've got other products on the top of the sunscreen, you would have to clean them back to reapply the sunscreen. But generally speaking, if you're just applying sunscreen to your um, the rest of your body, you can just top up essentially what you've got on there already. There's no need necessarily to um, cleanse before that. Yeah. And another question is that, um, do you feel like um, it's kind of a waste of money? Like if people pay um, a lot the sunscreen with like SPF 60 plus? I, I think that 
with sunscreen, often what you're paying for is the cosmetic elegance. And that was part of why I wanted to, to sort of bang on a bit about cosmetic elegance is because it is quite an important part of it. And that often is where your money is coming from. SPFs are very, or sunscreens are highly regulated in Australia and in many countries of the world. So you're getting what you're getting, whether you've bought a high-end brand or whether you've bought you know the cheapest off the the shelf at the supermarket you're getting the SPF protection the difference will then come down to ultimately that um, how it's going to feel on your skin and perhaps things like your um, the ability of that product to stay on your skin for the long enough period of time to have a good effect but I wouldn't be necessarily spending mega bucks on sunscreen I think you've got to use it at such a high um, level anyhow you've got to really slather it on quite liberally sure. so it, you've got to have a, a price point that can allow you to do that without scrimping yeah i'm um, sorry one question that i actually missed um so can, can people actually mix sunscreen and also the um like a bb cream or foundation so yeah, often, the often they will be combined together. What you'll notice is, is um, if a product's being formulated specifically, I don't actually mind that combination, the BB cream and the sunscreen together. The moisturiser and sunscreen, I think, sometimes battles the two elements okay. battle against each other. But the BB creams with the sunscreen, I think, is quite a nice combination mm -hmm. quite often. Often the SPF there will be just slightly lower, um, and again, it's so that you can still get that nice BB cream effect. Cool. And this question is from Daisy, actually. So Daisy is asking at what age um, you're required to have um, sunscreen? Well, I think it's a, that prevention is better than cure thing. So, so um, I think everyone can benefit from it. There is uh, the main thing about malignant melanoma is the main indicator of someone's risk of malignant melanoma is childhood exposure, extreme childhood exposure to UV. So that's the, the biggest risk factor there. And so therefore, yeah, there's no sort of... Um, essentially no bottom <laughs> sort of level of, of that. So I think the sooner you start taking care of your skin and using protection, the better. Yeah. Um, and another question is what kind of treatment or product um, should I take for dry skin? What, what type of foundation and face powder that's suitable for dry skin? I think I'd, I'd be going for a foundation that doesn't necessarily require a face powder. And that's where um, you can get actually um, primers that you can use before you use a, um, more, a foundation. Words clear. <laughs> so the primer essentially can hydrate your skin and look after your skin, but it also provides sort of a surface that can give a bit of adhesion per purchase for the foundation and that then prevents you needing to put a powder on the outside and that way because the powder is going to be absorbent the whole reason why we put powder on is to stop us shining mm -hmm. but the problem with that if you've already got a dry skin is that will further pull out um, the moisture and, and will cake quite a lot on a dry skin so try and avoid that so you can get richer um, foundations that feel a little bit moister on the skin but using a primer can really help keep that in position and prevent the need for using that powder afterwards all right thank you um, another question so um hi claire i like you uh like you have explained before that a um, vitamin c is good for skin but how if um people's skin is actually sensitive like they're sensitive to vitamin C. So what are the um, ingredients or what are the products that people with sensitive, sensitive skin that you would suggest to use? I think for the skin whitening, that is the risk with those. They are quite a harsh product to use to be fair, the, the skin whitening preparations. And I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend them. Um, I'd prefer in most instances for someone to have one of the dermal treatments that can tr treat pigment in a um, more controlled way where skin whitening preparations will tend to be quite irritant um, on the skin. So there's certain ingredients that are going to 
um, increase the irritancy profile of products. And it's essentially any of the peeling products, any of the fragrances, um, any of the surfactants, um, those sort of ingredients will tend to make the product a little bit more irritant on it. What tends to reduce the irritancy is the more emollient a product is. So the higher the oil content of a product, generally speaking, those oils, as long as they're not essential oils, they can be quite soothing on the skin and, and really help. One of the things I think you've got to aim for if you've got an irritated skin is repairing the barrier of your skin. And so really concentrating on the sort of emollients that can help with barrier. So you can get things like ceramides and um, squalene in products now that, that are really very good at um, effectively protecting that barrier and that will help with irritancy over time too. All right, thank you so much. Okay, now because we're extremely um, <laughs> over time. So um, I guess just okay. one last question. Um, so one last question would be... Fresh. Should we do the mask we, one? Oh yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, so we, we've got one on masks and I think that's yeah. probably quite a nice current one to, to do at the moment. Yeah. So one of the, the things that's been um, coined in recent times is when we've been wearing masks much more frequently is yeah. this mask knee, this acne because of our mask and little breakouts because of our mask. And that's often because you've got quite a level of occlusion and hydration around that part of the face. So if you have a particular problem with that, um, we're recommending that people cleanse when they remove their mask and try not to touch your face too much and have a, even a product that would be slightly more what we call occludent. So again, slightly higher in the oilier ingredients so that it leaves a little bit of film of protection on the skin as well but but cleansing immediately after removing um, the mask and maybe doing some gentle peeling procedures um, helps but it is it is one of those issues with having a very almost like a little sauna for your face <laughs> under the mask if you're needing to wear that for a long period of time cool thank you so much thank you so much for this wonderful and very informative session claire yeah, thank you it. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. I really enjoyed having a, a talk to everyone about it. And it was lovely for me to actually go through the process of thinking um, through the questions too. So thanks very much. Thank you everyone for attending today's event. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So tomorrow we are going to talk about nutrition, exercise, and also um, sleep. And I'll encourage you to wear comfortable clothes and also um, bring um, perhaps bring a bath tower with you so we can do some demo exercise together. Okay, once again, thank you everyone for attending and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone.